Welcome to the second part of network security. Here we will be looking a bit more into what botnets are actually being used for. So as we discussed before, botnets can be used in most uh, types of cybercrime. So that includes information theft, installation of malware, spam, click fraud, and participation in DDoS attacks. Uh, once a zombie is infected, it's often used for multiple kind of malicious activities with the most valuable uh, activities carried out first. We also discussed that um, that before. Uh, in, the intro in the introductory part, we saw an example where money was stolen from a bank and then transferred to a third party who was tricked to take out the money and go to Western Union and then uh, uh, he uh, or she lost the money. Uh, actually, this principle is worth taking a little bit more elaborate look at to understand how these kind of mules are often used in, uh, in this kind of crime. So where you see them are, are not only uh, when you're tricking people to do something, it can also be an idea, Nigeria letters, uh, which you might have heard of, where someone is uh, offering to send you a very large amount of money, and then you have to take out this money or do something with them and send them on to a third part, and you can keep part of it. But what often happens is that what you are supposed to do is that you are taking the money out so uh, the money can be... Uh, transferred electronically to you. This is a traceable transaction. Then the money are taken uh, out by you, for example, in cash, given to Western Union, where it cannot be traced anymore. So the traces stop at you, the electronic traces stop at you, and then, uh, of course, these money are from different kind of crime, and then you are the one helping to get them out to the, to the criminals. Another scam like this can be second-hand buyers, where someone is uh, advertising something in a, as a second-hand um, advertisement. Uh, so if you're trying to sell your old table, then you're contacted by a person who will give a lot of money for it, uh, and you will say, yes, of course, I can ship it to England or another country. Uh, when the money arrives in your account, you'll notice it's too much money. He will contact you and say, ah, could you please, I by mistake, I transferred too much money. Could you please tr transfer this money back to me? And when you uh, do that transaction, usually it's again a non-traceable transaction. So that's how it's done. And this is also what we see in this figure, where we can see that in the first step, uh, you hire mules or you recruit mules. In this example, um, you hire them, so you simply pay them to do it. And then you have the cyber criminal who in step two, so in step two, the mules will establish these accounts. So now they are available to use for the cyber criminal who can then make a bridge on a on some account or whatever kind of, a, yeah, usually that's the activity or to steal them from some kind of account, then transfer them to the mules, newly established accounts in step four. Then they are spread out to the different mules. They might keep part of the money uh, and then they take out the money um, transfer them via the transfer service, which is non-traceable, that's step number five, to the criminal's account, and who can then take out the money. Uh, so maybe he will only get 90%, but on the other hand, he's the guy here who is safe because he, tr he got the money in a, in a non-traceable way. Um, what is also important to keep in mind is that often we are talking about organized crime here, so we have uh, to... Uh, many of the large botnets, botnets are run really as a, as hardcore criminal business. So uh, one of the one of the main uh, persons are of course the botmasters who offer different kind of services. So you have a customer at the end, the customer who might uh, want to buy a DDoS attack or who want to want to buy a number of credit card numbers or personal sensitive information about one or more persons. He can contact the botmaster and then they agree about the price for doing so. Um, and the botmaster is then using his botnets or he can rent uh, botnets from other people to carry out these activities. We can also see that the botmaster is of often in the, in the, in the, uh, you can say in the very professional botnets has access to support or to developers who are specialized in either spreading uh, the, the, the malware or uh, developing malicious code. Uh, in order to fight the botnets, we often work with a model, and then we can we can use that for kind of discussing 
where we would like to, to counter the, the botnet and detect that it's present. So there is a phase one where it's born, so the malicious code is developed. There is a phase two, which is the infection that takes place here. So here the malicious code reaches the client and it is either installed itself or, or kind of exploit social engineering to let the human user install it. Then there is a command and control phase when the client is communicating with the botmaster, but no malicious activity is, as such is taking place. So no DDoS attack, no information stalls, but just the, com the communication uh, from the infected machine saying, I'm infected, I'm ready to serve your order. He might receive updates to the code and so on. Um, actually, that's a very interesting phase because there is very little traffic, but also it's here we really would like to to um, to be able to detect what is going on because at this stage we can prevent anything really bad from happening. Then after that phase, there is a phase four, the execution phase, where the client begins to carry out commands which it has received. So that could be here it started to steal information doing DDoS attacks and so on. Finally, the code is disposed, uh, the bot is cleaned, either because the botnet is taken down or because the, the infected client has been cleaned. Um, based on this, please go to quiz number eight and then see you here in a minute. Thank you so much.